This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, Fabrice. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, as I talk, do let me know if I need to speak slower or louder as I proceed. Okay. Um, so I suppose for many years, um, I have been going into various provincial archives in uh, the UK and cherry picking my sources, uh, what families have left behind, the diaries and letters and account books, but increasingly and rather probably belatedly realising that that has been without any real sense of the actual archive itself and how that has been shaped. And so I'm increasingly starting to look at the ways in which our analysis of our subjects is forged very much in terms of the legacies that, that people deliberately or, so, or um, through accident left behind. This is part of a bigger project and my working hypothesis is to consider the ways in which the 19th century was very much what I would call the age of writing. And I think as we have this age of writing, Victorian families are starting to think about how they archive their papers, and all, but also how they archive themselves. And I found that as I've started to think through that, I've found the um, scholarship of a lot of European historians very helpful. Um, especially Bagerman, who's noted for the Dutch context, uh, context, the family archive is not a neutral place. It is not a random collection of papers, but a paper bulwark built and rebuilt by generations with a specific function to preserve and protect a common family identity. I think in the um, terms of the UK scholarship, we're still very much in our infancy in terms of thinking about those processes. Some of you may know the uh, interesting book of Christopher Tolley, published a long time ago now in 1997. And he was looking at British evangelicals and trying to understand how the ways in which they memorialised themselves and each other was very much part of their identity as being belonging to a specific um, religious network. But my sense is that we don't really know how those practices were carried on beyond specific communities. Scholars who have looked at these questions have often assumed a gendered pattern. Um, this is certainly true of the American context. A uh, very rich work of Susan Stabile, who's looked at the American Republic, earlier Amer American Republic, and how women's preservation practices help to build up a particular kind of national memory built on the local, the particular, and the domestic. But I've increasingly started to wonder what happens if we disrupt those um, ideas to think of it not just in terms of something the women did, but to have a, a, a more clearly defined sense of how gender is operating in those contexts. <coughs> but also to think about the hierarchies of age. Uh, so as Fibri said, my current research is very much on children and juvenile agency. And I'm struck again and again by just how much children's material was kept and I suppose a lot of my work at the moment, a lot of my thinking about this project is to ask myself not just the kind of empirical data and what that shows us, but actually why was it kept in the first place? Um, that seems to me to be a, a significant research question. And obviously those kinds of acts of curatorship are made uh, at all different kinds of levels, sometimes subconscious sometimes very deliberate acts of curatorship. But one thing that is, um, uh, I think, an unsung feature 
of those papers that uh, I'm sure many of us are used to turning to in the archive is juvenile ephemera. And I'm wondering if I can start to uh, construct a genealogy of the family archive in which juvenile ephemera, the ephemeral um, productions of children, formed a ubiquitous but unacknowledged thread, stitching together ideas of family identity, emotional connection and lineage. But also, I'm wondering whether the young people themselves could have been active participants in that very process, helping to make those decisions and to shape those archives. Now, this is leaving me with some difficult uh, methodological questions, as you may imagine. As one historian of children's work has put it, historians of childhood must struggle not only to identify texts and other artefacts that bear the direct imprint of the young, but also to disentangle the complex interplay of juvenile and adult agency in their construction and use. Now, as um, I'm not sure what you're all working on, I'll be interested to hear that later. Um, but as uh, you, you're probably aware, the study of childhood, certainly in the British context, has enjoyed a real renaissance um, in recent years. Um, it, it's very much now at the cutting edge of a lot of um, publishing scholarly works. And within that, what we call the new history of childhood is starting to make its mark. And this uh, is very much influenced by departures in the social sciences, which want to conceptualise children as active agents in themselves. And that was very much my um, intellectual entree into this material, or in, into these themes. Because it struck me that in a lot of the existing uh, literature, on uh, uh, secondary literature on children, they were seen as the passive recipients of socialisation, as the ones who were educated and moulded and so on. And I wanted to uh, think about what happens if we turn that model upside down? Would it even make sense to have a trickle-up model of juvenile um, culture, whereby the children are actually uh, influencing the uh, ideas and the cultures of the adults around them. Within the new history of childhood, a number of scholars, particularly literary scholars, have started to excavate um, juvenilia, the, the works that people produced as children. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be aware of things like the, the works that the Bronte siblings produced, for example. And although that has been a very rich seam of work um, and that um, I have found very helpful myself, um, a lot of that work seems to be about looking at the early writings of people who went on to become famous. And I wanted to start looking at, shift our gaze away from the big names to try and understand how children's everyday writing might be very important within family cultures. And the paper today is on this extraordinary um, young woman. Do you see her there? Eva. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name either, so I'll just say Natchbull Hugson. Um, and the extraordinary juvenile archive that she created. She was born in 1861 to a family of the minor aristocracy. She had two older siblings, Catherine and Edward, and a younger brother, Cecil, to whom she was very close. Her father, Edward, he of the terrific beard, do you note, um, was later Lord Braeburn. He was a liberal politician. Um, he served under Gladstone for, uh, in the first ministry. And he enjoyed um, some limited success as a publisher of children's fairy tales. He had a tense relationship with Eva's mother, Annie, not least because he enjoyed a series of intimacies with young men, usually friends of his son, um, who were often brought into the home. 
12 year old Eva is very aware of the tensions this is creating and has a special name for these men. She calls them her father's ducky darlings. So it, 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 <laughs> there's a whole lot going on in that family. Like many Victorians, uh, the natural Huggersons exhibited uh, an intense interest in the genealogy of their, of their family and preserved family papers and account books and diaries and letters and so on across the generations. There's a further feature of the story which gives it um, a much greater cultural reach and that is because of this woman here, sorry about 17 going a bit stray. Um, this is obviously Jane Austen, the famous novelist. Um, so Eva, my subject, was the great, great niece of Jane Austen. Um, Jane Austen's works were enjoying um, a, a boom of uh, interest at the time of Eva's girlhood. Her cousin's, um, her father's cousin, Edward Austen Lee, um, had uh, published his memoirs of his aunt in 1869. Eva's father, Edward, inherited his mother's letters, so Jane Austen's niece, when his mother died in 1882, and he subsequently set about producing his own kind of version of Jane Austen through publishing her letters in 1882. And as, as literary scholars have noted, scholars of Austen, this was a publication of the publication of Austen's letters, which sought to position her very much as part of the Kent, uh, the county of Kent, where um, the natural Huggersons come from, very much their Jane, um, in kind of tension with the Hampshire um, branch of the family who'd published the earlier um, memoirs. Eva herself regularly read Jane Austen's novels. She commented them on them in her diary with pride. She always refers to her as Aunt Jane, even though this was a woman who even her father hadn't met. Um, and so to my mind, this is very in keeping with the vernacular memory narratives that she's building up and how she and her family wish to think of themselves. There's a further feature of this which I think is significant, and that is that when Eva was 10 years old, her father's cousin, Austin Lee, issued a new edition of his memoir of Jane Austen. And this time he published some of the um, previously unknown um, early novels of, of Austen, um, such as Lady Susan um, and some other juvenilia. So Eva would have grown up with a very acute sense of the significance and potential of female literary production, and indeed of girlhood literary production. And as we'll see, that was just one of the um, sources of empowerment to Eva, who negotiated a whole um, sort of quite complicated networks of um, competing discourses of girlhood to become one of the first generation of young women to study at Newnham College, uh, Cambridge. So we're going to go on in a minute to, understand, uh, to have a look at um, Eva's um, cultural and literary productions. Um, but first of all, I, I just want to emphasise that I, I'm trying to trace out the politics of the archive. And um, I'm interested uh, in thinking about the kind of power relations at work in the archive, uh, and, and to think the extent to which, if we're looking at juvenile texts, does that mean that we need to develop a new kind of archival hermeneutics? In some senses, Eva would have seen herself as a, as a sort of semi-official historian or curator of the family. Uh, like many young girls, uh, this slide isn't going to be very clear, it's not very clear in the original, um, she had the uh, an enviable task of pasting together all her father's newspaper cuttings in this scrapbook, and she often talks about having to do this. And Edward himself uh, then goes through and indexes them, his many achievements. So on the one hand, she's constructing or asking, being asked to construct this kind of official memory of her father's political affairs. But as we'll see, 
um, there are other, through other writing practices, I think she's trying to position herself or is acting as a much more subversive curator of the family memory. Her multi-layered texts create um, a whole array of different versions of family experiences and histories. So today we're going to look at a, a number of Eva's diary formats in particular, including um, a rather extraordinary and I think unique phenomenon genre called the Cricket Chronicles, um, some of her manuscript novels, and if we've got time, um, I'd, I'd like to discuss a little bit her participation in a national ma manuscript magazine. And as we sample these texts, um, I want to share with you some of the key questions that I'm trying to sort of think through myself as I d digest this material. Um, so to be clear, Eva is just um, you know, one part of the much broader project in which I'm looking at a whole array of juvenile uh, writing. So what are the politics of the family archive? What might the archival turn mean for children's writing? And how might children's ephemera even matter? So let's start with the diaries. Welcome to Eva. Uh, this is Eva uh, celebrating her 12th birthday. Um, the prevalence of diaries in family collections is, is striking. Uh, they come up again and again. Um, and I think they're suggestive of, of the, the prevalence of them is suggestive of the many different functions that they served for the Victorian family. They were a disciplinary tool, they were a mode of education, um, uh, often uh, a vehicle for self-development, um, and um, they were often a, a way of interweaving family practices, family uh, pedagogical practices, with uh, also keeping a record of, of the family itself. But I've noted that, uh, and this is unscientific, <laughs> that girls' diaries uh, seem to um, be kept um, disproportionately in relation um, to those of boys. There are far more girls' diaries than boys' diaries. Um, so my hypothesis is that girls mattered. Girls mattered to the ways in which families wanted to remember themselves and how they wanted to uh, promote their own self-image. I'm thinking that they form a kind of nexus, a testing point for family ideologies. They allow the Victorian family to reflect upon themselves in a particular kind of way and to reenact, to re-remember a sort of focal tool of reminiscence of past uh, family events. As you uh, may well be aware, there are multiple and overlapping practices of journal keeping and we'll, we'll see some of those today. They are often written collaboratively or written in parallel um, and reading out one's own diary or perusing the diaries of each other was a very important part of the sociable practices of, of elite Victorian families. Diaries formed a springboard to other kinds of personal writing. They are often a rough copy for more ambitious works of natural observation, poetic composition, or maybe just stories of the self. These complex diary patterns are very much in evidence in the Natural Hugson archive. So her father keeps two diaries, um, an almost indecipherable daily account, um, and also a longer parliamentary record of his political life. Eva's sister Catherine keeps two diaries, one of which is a secret book of confessions, usually of um, young men she seems to be attracted to, and, and Eva is sometimes allowed to write in that diary. Eva's diary keeping there, as I think, is the most complex of all. And in her overlapping diaries, I think she found ways to express conventional expectations of femininity, but also numerous ways to resist such a, such a subject position. But with Eva, as with the other children that I'm looking at, I'm also interested in their kind of knowingness of the genre and how they can play around with it. So diary scholars often talk about the formlessness of diaries, you know, how they don't have a structure, they don't have a narrative. This doesn't seem to be the case uh, with these productions. Uh, as you can see, Eva has indexed her diary, and we'll come back to that index. And here's the last entry for this diary. You, know, you get that, that sense of 
narrative closure. Um, let's go back to this one. <laughs> so, Eva, I think, on, on some levels, is, is um, often evoking, I suppose, a material culture of girlhood. She seems very invested in this, and I think this self-presentation in the pink dress uh, really exemplifies that. Um, I'll give you a quote from a little bit later on this diary, her 13th birthday. Um, it, it opens, my 13th birthday and a 13 exclamation marks. I had my presents from Mama, a small musical book, which plays four times God Save the Queen, Bonnie Dundee, the Carnival of Venice, and Off Through the Stilling Night. From Papa, an awfully jolly horse and carriage for my dolls. From Ned, small watercolour paint box, a cake, pretty to look at, but was not very nice. Um, so she's got a very sort of keen sense of what she should be recording. And uh, here, the, the, the pressed flowers, you know, very, again, very much in keeping with, I suppose, how she might have felt she was expected to um, act as a young diarist, as a young female diarist, um, you know, pressing these flowers. But to my mind, this is a kind of hyper-performance of Victorian girlhood, um, a performance which maybe secures her a position in the family emotional economy. Um, and I, in thinking through some of these issues, I found the work of the American childhood historian, um, someone called Karen Sanchez Epler, very helpful. She wrote a great book in 2005 on American um, childhood. And she found that when she looked at children's diaries and letters, that even children can be charmed by the idea of the child, which I think is, is, is a, a, a very intriguing way of looking at it. So that made me think about the ways in which the, the subject position of the child might be one which can be knowingly employed by a juvenile subject. But as we'll see, it's very complex. Oh, well, everything's always complex, isn't it? But if we go back to the um, index, there's something more intricate going on here than simply a record of Victorian um, femininity. I don't know if this has got a pointer on it. I can just direct you to it, if not. Um, so in many ways, this is also a celebration of bad behaviour. Okay. Um, if you can see page 24, it says the rotten eggs. Okay. This was um, a, a, a sort of moment in family history that goes down in family folklore, as these things do. Her and her brother went uh, into the garden, found a jackdaw's nest, collected a whole load of eggs, waited for them to go rotten, packed them up in their trunk, then when they uh, go to London for the parliamentary season, doing all the hustle and bustle of you know, the household arriving, they go upstairs to the nursery and start pelting passers-by with, with rotten eggs. Mm. I know, she's not pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a great example of the kind of intertextuality that goes on in this family, because her father uses incidents that she records in the index in his own children's stories. And Eva, when she then writes children's stories in the 1880s, rewrites the stories. The rotten eggs you know, go through many uh, different versions in, in family folklore. I'm also rather intrigued by, I can see it, number 44, Reggie's funeral. Um, Reggie's her doll. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm intrigued by the kind of significance of that, that uh, on, on the one hand, you know, she's celebrating all the kind of girlish presents she's given, but the thing she also chooses to record um, in her diaries is very elaborate funeral that she stages for one of them. So it's a, a, a complex cultural artefact, a very complex presentation of the self going on here. Um, and I think in order to tease out what's going on, um, we need to understand some other child diarists 
um, this image isn't very clear, I'm afraid. This is Marjorie Fleming. I don't know if any of you have come across Marjorie Fleming. Um, you can buy copies of Marjorie Fleming's diary still, and it's worth the money. They are hilarious. Um, Marjorie Fleming was a little Scottish girl who died at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and the year that Eva was born, 1861, her diaries get a huge amount of publicity um, when they're brought to public attention and they're published. And these diaries, which say that they're, they're extraordinarily funny, they're full of wit, they're full of verve, kind of terrible you know, rhyming poems, are widely celebrated by the Victorian sort of middle class literary public. Even though Marjorie in no way conformed to models of polite childhood behaviour, she referred to herself as a little devil and she reported often with seeming relish of her many acts of disobedience. So I'm interested in the ways in which if we excavate girlhood diaries, we might find the genre helps us to um, unsettle some of the rather, I think, pious narratives that we are often um, given about uh, contemporary girls. And as we consider uh, the Eva diary material, there's something else that we need to remember, and that is that Eva and her family, like many Victorians, sat around and reread old family diaries. And I'm finding extraordinary the extent to which this happens across generations. You know, you read your great aunt's childhood diary, you read your grandmother's um, diary, and so on. So Eva is composing this subversive text, and as you can see, she's gone into some trouble, you know, to, to, to make it a, a striking artefact, knowing that it might well be kept um, as a family treasure in itself. But Eva keeps another diary during this period. And looking at the second text helps us, I think, to problematise yet further what's going on in the first one that we've looked at. So the first one was obviously um, written in a, a free-form notebook. But this second diary, which overlaps in rather complicated chronological ways, you can see it's a, a pre-printed um, diary. Um, it, it won't be possible, I don't think, for you to, to read it. It's quite hard to read in the original. But what she's done is turned the diary on its, on its side, obviously. And it says, um, I'll say I'm sleepy, and like, I'll go upstairs. And then you come up and follow me, and we'll have some fun. So you can imagine that maybe they're at dinner or at tea, and she's using it as a notebook, you know, probably to pass to her brother, brother Cecil. Um, and I found that is very common with, with um, juvenile diaries, that when children are knowingly being subversive, they often turn the diary around, which I find quite uh, interesting in itself. Um, and in this diary, Eva is also literally interpreting the function of the pocketbook. So here she is saying... Uh, I am now always going to keep this book in my pocket and write in it anything I want to, in pencil, of course, and then when I get time, in ink. And then she's um, done a great flourish of a signature, like, like children, often, children often do. Um, so she's using the diary almost kind of like an you know, extension of the cell, like a mobile phone that she's keeping literally in her pocket. And she uses this to very subversive effect. So um, in diary scholarship, um, there's a great deal of debate about the immediacy effect and how diarists often purport that you know, something has just happened and that you know, they're just writing it up, even though you know, that it may be something that, that, that happened a number of weeks ago. So Eva is using this immediacy effect and taking it to its kind of apotheosis. Um, and there are lots of examples in the diary of that. Uh, this is probably my favourite one, I think, where, where she writes, We're in church singing awful Te Deum. Cecil is drawing in his prayer book while I'm writing this, and the litany is going on. Yeah, so she's using it as a very kind of um, dissentient record of um, the adult culture around her. In her very rich analysis of American girlhood diaries, 
the historian Jane Hunter found that they provided routes of mediation. She classified them as surrogate battlefields upon which girls struggled to blend family expectation with personal impulse. I find that a useful um, way into thinking about girls' diaries, but I also think that there is another layer uh, of analysis that, that we need to think about. Um, so recent studies on girlhood, um, and I think the best example of this is a new <coughs> book by Christina uh, Maruzzi on the periodical press, girlhood periodical press, um, has explored how once you look at correspondence pages in the magazines, you get a much more multifaceted, interesting picture of contemporary girls uh, who are writing in to challenge you know, representations of, them, of um, their life cycle stage that they're seeing in the magazine. Um, and she explores the ways in which um, girls are helping to form notions of girlhood themselves. So I'm wondering whether an earlier model of sco scholarship tended to say here's the, you know, the, the sort of characterisation of Victorian femininity, let's see how far this subject conformed to it or rebelled away from it. Um, maybe we need to move beyond that into thinking a more multi-dimensional approach and to thinking how children as social actors are also playing a part in their own representation. In Eva's case, as we've seen, this includes a playful experimentation with existing genre and a willingness to voice sardonic commentaries on the activities around her and to project a willful juvenile voice. To develop this further, I want to consider um, another aspect of Eva's manuscripts, um, which in many ways are the most fun. <laughs> uh, and this is the Cricket Chronicles. Um, I have to say, I know nothing about cricket. I'm going to have to ask my father-in-law to teach me all about cricket uh, in order to really work out what's going on here. Um, this is now the summer, as you can see, of 1875, and Eva is, is 13. And uh, here she seems to have devised a more sophisticated literary strategy than the earlier ones of subverting the diary genre, whilst also registering her critique of adult culture. Now, in order to get into this, I think I need to say a little bit about um, cricket. There's a <coughs> sentence I never thought I'd say. Um, and the importance of cricket uh, to the, this family and their wider circles. So both of Eva's um, brothers played for their public school, which was Eton. Um, her eldest brother, Ed, uh, Ned, even had a live-in cricket coach, which I was quite struck by. Um, and Cecil himself uh, went on to play county cricket for Kent, which is a big deal. Um, the relationship between elite masculinity, sport, and the Victorian public school has been uh, well documented, as, as you may well know. And in a recent study, Anthony Bateman has further explored the discursive transformation of cricket in the mid-Victorian era. And he plots how it was at precisely this point that the way in which uh, cricket is described, um, uh, cricket um, participants describe uh, themselves and the activity, um, how it emerges as a literary form which is seen as essential to imperial government governance and the performance of the British male elite. Now, in many ways, the practices and the literary discourses of cricket symbolised a gendered separation that I think is probably truer than just about any other aspect of Victorian cultural life in some respects. And this is especially true in the 1870s when Eva is writing. Because earlier traditions of female village cricket had started to die out. The sport was becoming increasingly bureaucratised and um, reconstructed on male-dominated lines. And it was not until the 1880s that there were significant calls from um, some quarters 
for women and girls to play cricket themselves. But the girls in either set appear to have shared an extraordinary level, and I say extraordinary because I really don't get it, but extraordinary level of enthusiasm um, for cricket. If we go back to the index, could we see 46 cricket at Canterbury, 50 R cricket, 51 other matches, and so on. So recording attendance at cricket matches was seemingly an important feature of family life that Eva wished to mark. Well, the tens of thousands of women who flocked to watch public school boys playing cricket matches in the 1870s, or their growing enthusiasm for county cricket, I don't think were doing it just out of love of the game, but maybe they were. Uh, <laughs> Female spectatorship, I think, is complex, again, and could operate on many levels. Uh, the performance of the gendered body, both of men, as we'll see uh, in a moment, but also of women, appears to have been very integral to the experience. Um, the, the display of high fashion was something that comes up again and again in uh, reports of, of female, uh, female participation at uh, cricket events but also participation in the rituals and spectacle of the game um, seem to be very important in, in how um, uh, people respond to it. So I think it also has resonances with how elite families understand their political ties to a, a specific location. So in Eva's case, supporting the county team of Kent seems to be woven into her pride in a regional identity, which comes up a lot in the diaries, and a sense of cultural ownership over this political space, where she knows that generations of her family um, have, been, have you know, represented the area's MPs. When recording her attendance at public school matches, Eva presents herself as a very confident cultural actor. She dwells on the upper class socialising in which she engaged, although there is an awful lot of, um, you know, scorecards and so on as well going on. Um, but I would suggest that cricket may have been a highly gendered act, which contributed to the cultural hegemony of a political and imperial elite. But it's important to excavate how women too form part of this corporate identity and were contributors to the public spectacle of the sport. Eva is at pains um, to demonstrate her familiarity with all the kind of in phrases that you're supposed to use at these events. It's a very kind of stylized mode of, of support. Um, she records with seeming relish, you know, her, 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 her cultural knowledge uh, in this field. She says, half the fun is calling out steady, well played, where's Harrow? Oh, well asked. But she also performs, adopts a persona of juvenile naughtiness to emphasise just how actively she performs support for her team. So at the Harrow versus Eton match, she goes behind the backs of um, the opposing team supporters and takes off the ribbon that they're wearing, uh, the colour they're wearing to indicate that they're Harrow supporters, and she switches them for pale blue ribbons supporting an uh, Eton team. You can see they must have absolutely loved her. Um, so that is the background, I think, in order to understand uh, what's going on here with the Smith Cricket Chronicle. Uh, there's, there's a whole um, series of them this summer. They're very, very um, fragile documents, as you can probably see. So the Cricket Chronicles use a similar kind of mischievous tone, but she also uses the text, I think, to contest her own marginalisation from the match. And there's this sense of literally, <laughs> physically, being on the margins um, enables a, you know, what I'm sort of playfully calling a juvenile gaze, which subjects the dominant men before her to a really kind of searing mockery. The journals themselves constitute an arch and comic mimicry, very much in the form of a running sports commentary, supposedly as the match unfolds. So again, she's using that idea of the, the diary being a pocketbook 
being something that you literally called what's happening in the moment, but again, taking it to a very subversive level. The occasion um, for these uh, chronicles is three high profile matches played in the parish of Smith in Kent. Um, one against uh, a mixed military 11, and this is the only picture I could find, it's a bit blurred, against this team, um, the titles at the bottom, the Ezingari cricket team. Is there anyone here actually knows about cricket? <laughs> It'd be great if you did. Um, well, I am, I am now feel that I'm the expert on Victorian cricket then, and I can tell you that Ezingari are a kind of um, peripatetic team that do sort of show matches and they go around the country and they're, they're very famous. So this cricket match against this little, you know, um, a supposedly a parish team, we'll come on to that, in this tiny um, village in Smith, was reported in the press and it's uh, written up in, in the cricket archives. So her father, Edward, uses um, his public school and parliamentary networks to put together this like stellar team to try and beat uh, this famous uh, Izingari um, group. And he draws in a whole host of young men um, who uh, I've now found out were actually you know, sort of the up and coming cricket stars of their generation. But in Eva's commentary, these young men emerge not as prodigious specimens of manly ath athleticism, as her father presumably wanted them to be judged. They emerge as hapless, incompetent, and comically inept. <coughs> so, 21-year-old Kemp, Arthur Kemp, was at this time captain of the very prestigious Harrow cricket team, but in Eva's uh, diary account, she emphasised how Mr. Kemp has muffed another ball. About, you know, eight exclamation marks. 27-year-old Randall Plunkett, that is actually his name, Randall Plunkett, a frequent house guest at Eva's home, had recently become MP for Gloucester and was playing for the House of Commons 11. He fared even worse. Eva writes, he always is the last in anything good, the first in anything bad. This, she seemed to think, was poetic justice, for he has been so conceited about his bowling that it's a good thing. Eva appeared to particularly enjoy satirising the performance of Edward Littleton. Littleton was, had been captain of the Eton Eleven, and three years later, he was to lead the Oxford University team that beat the Australian national team, and that's in 1878. But Eve is especially merciless in her account of his performance. Littleton goes in, I hope he'll make 50 runs. He has plenty of confidence, perhaps a little too much, but I'm not sure I can scarcely believe my own eyes. Littleton, who is to make 50 runs. Littleton, who we thought would be so useful. Littleton is dot, 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 out. Yes. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. We have got a nice 11, but I did think he would do some good. He should be ashamed of himself. You don't need to feel sorry for Littleton. <laughs> we'll come on to him. Within um, contemporary cricket writing, one of the most significant discourses to emerge was that of the bodily aesthetic of the elite male player. His beauty and elegance, the grace of his movement and deportment. When Edward Littleton later looked back to cricket playing during this period, this was certainly how he presented it. He emphasised how we unconsciously conceived of beauty almost entirely in terms of physical motion and physical skill. Eva, you won't be surprised to hear, uh, portrayed it rather differently because what this actually seems to be is, is, a, is a cricket, you know, it's cricket matches going wrong. So uh, you can see Kemp letting a ball pass. <laughs> then we've got Mr. Hallett running in from the rain. Ned bowling, he gets off quite lightly. Then we've got Littleton 
and she's put flowers around it to really you know, drive the point home. Littleton, uh, with a tent cover over his head, this is where they all have to run for cover. Um, so she mocks him as this really pathetic sight. Mr. Littleton looks like an Arab. He has put a tent cover over his head. Kemp holds a table over his. You can see Kent in the bottom there. Mr. Plunkett holds up one of our parasols. The rest all look wet and foolish. And I do want to draw your attention to this character here. The dog is called Venom. <laughs> Says it all. And I love the way that Venom is looking at him. <laughs> so much um, recent work on juvenilia has considered the ways in which children adopt or appropriate an adult voice. But in a very helpful essay in 2005, Peter Alexander said, well, we also need to capture the child critique of the adult and not simply to see it as a mimetic form of writing. Cricket was an important feature of Eva's social and cultural life. These texts and the care which has gone into them celebrated in many ways the significance of the matches to her family and their local status. But Eva's cricket commentary also functioned as an example of the child critique, using strategies of the makeshift creativity of everyday life to puncture the smooth authority of masculine performance. William Corsaro, um, who um, is a sociologist of, of children, I found his work very helpful, has argued that children's culture needs to be understood as a process of dynamic interaction with the adult world. He suggests that children appropriate aspects, uh, motives and elements from the broader social world around them and creatively forge new meanings from them. This, he says, says amounts to active cultural production. He explains, children do, do not merely internalise individually the external adult culture, rather children become a part of adult culture. And I find this a helpful perspective um, and a kind of postscript to the Cricket Chronicles is that in um, a, a light-hearted postscript in some ways, but is that Eva's strategies may well have been effective. In his autobiography, Edward Littleton later recalled playing cricket in the mid-1870s uh, and the humiliation of having to make small talk with female spectators at, at village cricket matches after making serious sporting blunders. You know, what a fool you feel. But the childishness, if it is childishness, of the juvenile voice in these texts, uh, in the Cricket Chronicle text, might require further thought. Because Eva puts a footnote, I mean a literal footnote, in her commentary on Littleton, in which she casts aspersions on his manliness, he's uh, 20 at this time, while also seeming to vent her frustration of how he, he and her brother Ned had apparently teased her. She writes... Ned called his little sister a devil. Mr. Littleton is a horrid, rude, obnoxious, objectionable, ob objectionable boy. He isn't a man, and I'm not, underlined, little. <laughs> the employment of this childish voice I find quite intriguing there. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do with it yet. Uh, I wonder if Eva is pushing against the subject position of the child. Uh, note how her family continue to give her presents such as dolls, even though she's in her early teens. Or was she herself employing a juvenile mode in this instance? So more broadly, it's helping me to think in what ways do the young uh, deploy particular authorial stances, including juvenile ones, for strategic, cultural or effective purposes? Because I'm struck that the kind of voice that we see being articulated at that point is very different to the much more mature authorial voice that she's employing in other texts at this time. So, um, this is the frontispiece 
of uh, one of Eva's manuscript novels, a bit of a classic called The Netherpont Tragedy. Um, and she was writing the, the same, you know, roughly contemporaneous with the Smith Cricket Chronicles. Well, actually, for, for me, I've got, I see it as, as, the next slide was out of order, but the, you hardly need to be told that that's the little to know. <laughs> the dashing chap. So you can see there's a certain kind of frisson that's been going on in their, in their interactions. Um, here's a portrait gallery of the characters in this classic piece of fiction, which is the Nether, the Netherpont um, tragedy. Um, I'm particularly uh, struck at the ways in which, in her manuscript fiction at this time, she's, uh, Eva is using a rather similar authorial strategies to the young Jane Austen. So I don't know if any of you have <coughs> ever read any of the works that Austen produced in, in her teens, but she has very funny comic dedications where she satirises uh, comic, um, satirises literary conventions. This was a practice also employed by Eva. So the Netherpont tragedy um, is dedicated jokingly to her sister Catherine. Dear Catherine, in dedicating to you this simple account of the affections of a maiden, I have striven to provide for you an example through life. I do not wish you to fall in love with an adventurer, but if you do, stick to him. Take the advice of your sister, mm -hmm who has seen many of the vicissitudes of life and who will not fail to be happy. I have the happiness to remain, dearest Kate, your well-meaning and benevolent sister, the authoress. Copies of the Netherpont tragedy and, and other aspects of her literary oeuvre were copied and circulated uh, to family and friends. So it, it forms part of the literary genealogy of Eva's kinship um, network. So Eva's juvenile cultural practices had wider significance for the ways in which the family chose to remember and represent itself. And this includes providing Eva a space with which to gently satirise aspects of her family story. In one um, piece of work, Jenks the Poet, begun in the same year, 1875, the villain is um, a sharp boy and a bully named Spratson who is identified in the text as a supporter of William Gladstone, which must be a very knowing reference given that her father was, um, had recently been a member of Gladstone's cabinet himself. And when seen in the context of her father's very egocentric, um, I have to say self-important um, political diaries from this period, the preservation of this other kind of family material with these comic references seems to indicate a much richer family archive. In other ways too, Eva finds small strategies to express a knowingness of her um, father's self-centeredness. Um, I won't go into this um, now, but we can discuss it uh, over questions. I compared her diary with his diary um, for a series of, of, um, of about four or five months and the subtle differences between them um, but were very, very uh, revealing uh, as to um, the ways in which she's trying to position her father, I think. Um, so all the time that we're thinking about these documents that Eva is producing, let's remember that she's also constructing the kind of the official Edward Braeburn um, through the scrapbook and is keeping that family document. So she's also at the same time in sort of uh, managing to interject another a light motif within the family archive. She also delineated a private cultural subjectivity in another way. A further layer of the diaries is that in 1878, she starts to um, use a diary code. And um, I can't take credit for this. This is all down to my very lovely father-in-law um, who cracked the diary code for me. Um, and it turns out that uh, she was secretly studying Latin and Greek. Um, I would be interested to hear your ideas as to why she might have wanted to have put that in diary code. I think it's quite com complicated. Um, 
Her father was broadly supportive of Eva's cultural activities, um, but he was ambivalent about women's wider political ambitions. Um, it speaks volumes for the man that one of his presents to Eva and her siblings in 1874 at Christmas was a copy of his latest children's collection of stories, which features one tale called The Pig-Faced Queen. Um, it's a deeply, um, to my mind, unpleasant satire with very vulgar illustrations of a pig-faced queen, um, illustrating the evils of female political power. So perhaps it's not surprising that Eva and her brother draw up a secret contract um, concerning their agreement that he will help her to learn Latin. But I also wonder whether it's a more um, studied construction of a private self within this diary. It's not necessarily that I think he, uh, her father would have been horrified by it, um, but it is part of herself that, that she wanted to keep um, intimate at this particular point. As I noted earlier, and I'm getting towards the end now, um, Eva's study of Latin and Greek has a happy ending in some respects in that she's able to convince her parents to let her study at Newnham College. This underlines the extent to which, while benefiting enormously from all the cultural and political privileges of her birth, Eva was active in seeking out her own literary and intellectual path. And this is also evident in Eva's participation in broader literary projects. And this is the moment, the literary project, that I'm most excited by. In February 1878, Eva responds to an advertisement that she had seen in the popular girls' magazine, Aunt Judy, calling for contributors to a manuscript magazine. And this is um, a cultural phenomenon that, as far as I can tell, has... has yet to be studied or even referenced um, by, by literary and historical scholars. These are national magazines. Young people um, write into um, well-known periodicals and say, I'm starting up a manuscript magazine. Write to me if you want to join. You have to pay a subscription. There are various kind of rules. Um, and these extraordinary productions are then passed around this national network of people that you don't know, but you now have a very tangible sense that you're participating in a, in a, a cultural um, national network. Um, manuscript publication, um, I suppose we normally think of in terms of the early modern period and the manuscript circulation of print. Um, and I'm intrigued by the possibility that maybe children and young people could be especially influential in helping to keep the genre of manuscript circulation alive well into the 19th century in a kind of dialectic with print periodical culture. Each issue of a manuscript magazine, this one is called The Barnacle. Um, sorry that the image is so poor. Um, this is one that was um, associated with Charlotte Young. It's not quite the same as the, the, the phenomenon that I'm talking about because this was a, a manuscript magazine that was circulated to a cultural network of women that she knew, but it's the closest I've got to it at the moment. Um, barnacle as in barnacle geese. So uh, she's, uh, Charlotte Young is the mother goose figure and she has her goslings and they're often sailing away, which I, I, I quite like as a kind of... Uh, symbol of, of female cultural uh, uh, achievement. And this is the kind of thing, I mean, that the, the names and addresses are pasted in so that you know who to send it on to next. But I think this also gives it a very tangible feel, as I say, it's very much part of the material culture um, that I think is particularly exciting for, for participants. Over the course of the next few months, writing pieces for her manuscript magazine um, becomes a constant preoccupation of Eva. Uh, most significantly, she uh, writes um, a biography of her great-great-aunt, Jane Austen, which I'm currently tantalising Austen scholars with because we haven't yet traced it, um, for which she won a prize. I think the age profile of contributors is also an important part of the story. 
typically speaking, um, and there are usually age-related rules for contributors. Um, the participants seem to be in their mid-teens to early 20s. And in the case of uh, females, this seems to tie in with a, a, a sort of burgeoning sense of what's often called young womanhood in this period, which I'm tentatively, very tentatively, suggesting that this is a new kind of phenomenon that we're seeing at this moment, reminding us of how we need to employ different age categories when excavating the experiences of past generations. So rather than um, being seen as a piece of juvenilia in that sense, the fact that you're participating in a, in a project that's of you know, people in their mid-teens to their early 20s, I think gives a kind of greater cultural weight to the, this, this kind of production. And I think this may well have been, uh, although my research is very much the initial stage, is potentially empowering for teenage girls, um, especially, at a moment when I think there's a growing notion of female cultural citizenship. So just some concluding remarks, and then I'll have had my full uh, allotted time. The literary inventiveness of Eva's output may be exceptional, but I would argue that in finding a central place for a refashioned sense of self or selves in family and literary histories, she was in many ways exemplary of a new generation of girls. As we've seen, this was facilitated by her participation in multiple and overlapping cultural communities. The boyhood world of Latin and Greek scholarship, her own literary uh, kinship, the wider network of manuscript uh, production and so on. Through these diverse channels, Eva was able to fashion multiple cultural identities and this included a broader reimagining of the intellectual opportunities available to her. In the process, she contributed to, uh, in numerous ways, to a material culture of family remembrance. This resulted in an archive which works in often subtle counterpoint to that of her father. Karen uh, Sanchez Epler has argued that in 19th century America, childhood was itself increasingly recognised as a sign of class status. That is to say, uh, protracted, you know, lengthy childhoods could in themselves be a marker of wealth and privilege. That 13-year-old Eva is presented with toys, tea sets and dolls in the same year in which Parliament, and presumably her father, was debating raising the age of consent for girls from 12, seems that a similar analysis might be applicable for Britain. But as we've seen, um, this is quite a, a sort of knotty subject position for an individual to maintain. Or maybe there are multiple categories of age through which young girls and young boys might, understood, might understand and represent themselves. The cultural geographer Calio has said, exploring what children do rather than what children are is a simple but often overlooked insight. And I think this is one that um, might be helpful to explore for the history of childhood. So in place of adult-child dualisms, maybe we also need to understand how girlhood and other constructed categories of age, especially gendered ones such as girlhood, might have had shifting salience to the young themselves but also how new uh, and empowering opportunities for girls, particularly, of course, in the sphere of education, were achieved not just through top-down um, projects of educational reform, but also through the active exertion of young females themselves. Thank you.